Well, here we are. It's Resurrection Day. It's your day. It's our day. If you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is a great day of celebration. It's your day. And if you're tuning in and you're not a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, it can be your day. This is a day of miracles, and we want that to be true for you. It's Resurrection Day. You know, for weeks now, people have been saying that Easter was going to be canceled. Uh, We've been hearing that over and over again. But that's impossible because the resurrection's already happened. Jesus has already given his life. He was buried. He rose from the dead. And the event has happened. You can't cancel Easter. You can't cancel Resurrection Day. It is our day, and we're celebrating it today. And I'm glad that you're here. Because if you came looking for hope, you came to the right place. The Apostle Peter, you remember when he walked with Jesus in that first century, Uh, Before the night was over, he had denied Jesus three times, denied he even knew him. And then after the resurrection, after the power of resurrection, when he saw Jesus again, he was singing a whole different tune. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, the scripture says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. God is offering to us a living hope, not a dead hope. A a living hope means a real hope, a genuine hope. Hope, something that we can bank on and count on. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus changed Peter's life. And I trust that it's going to change your life this morning. That's what we want to talk about. The living hope. It's a story of real promise. It's a story of lasting peace. It's a story of life-changing power. This morning, the peas are wild. Remember, promise and peace and power. That's what the resurrection story is all about this morning. So buckle up. It's a story about chaotic peace. It's about experience the fullness and wholeness of God in our lives in the midst of the chaos. In the midst of whatever is happening out there, God is offering to us peace. It comes through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And so we want to find the solution this morning for the chaos that we're dealing with in our lives. It reminds me of a story of a a great law professor. He would begin his class at the start of every year, the same way. He'd go to a chalkboard like this, and he'd grab the marker, and on the board he would write two numbers. He would write a four and a two. And he'd leave it on the board. And then he would ask his students a simple question. He'd ask them, what's the solution? And after he asked the the question, students would shout out answers like six. And another would yell, two. And then a group from over here would yell, eight. And at every response, the teacher would just shake his head. And then the professor finally pointed out the error of the students. He said this, There is one reason why you cannot find the solution. And this is because you failed to ask the key question, What is the problem? Class, unless you know what the problem is, you will never find the solution. People are looking for peace. You're probably looking for peace in the midst of the struggles and challenges and the storm. You're probably looking for peace. And if we want to know that solution, if we want to know the peace of God, we have to ask the key question this morning What's the problem? You see, often when we talk about peace, people think the problem and the reason they're not experiencing the peace of God in their life is because of the circumstances they're in, the things that they're facing in life. But that's not true. Peace is about what's in us, not what's outside of us. The peace of God is an inner peace that God's talking about. And so this morning, as we talk about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, we we need to understand how we find this peace in the midst of the chaos by kind of understanding the context of this story of promise and peace and power. I hope you had a chance to really enjoy the Blacklight dramatic presentation that we showed to you this morning. 
because it helps give us context for the resurrection story. Someone once said that a text without a context is merely a pretext. In other words, you can take a text and make it mean whatever you want, get to the conclusion of whatever you want if you don't have a context. Our context for the resurrection story, this story of promise and peace and power, comes in that picture of the Garden of Eden, that place of paradise that God created. You see, well, it was in that place that God promised a Savior. If you had a chance to watch that incredible blacklight drama, you saw God creating this paradise, this incredible place of peace where Adam and Eve were together with God in this perfect peace. And in that perfect peace, they were enjoying a connection with God. And then the serpent came and, and tempted them and deceived them and tricked them. And they came to a point in their connection with God where God was offering peace in the most tranquil situation, the most satisfying. And they said, God, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> when he said, you, you can eat from any of the fruit of the garden, but not this one. They said, okay, God, thanks, but no thanks. We're going to try and go at this our, our own. And in that moment when they choose to rebel against God, Sin entered the world, our, our rebellion against God. And they were banished from paradise. They were banished from experiencing the connection with God. And they lost peace, what God is offering. And in fact, in the garden, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, something incredible happened in that moment. God said, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. In that moment, God said there was a declaration of war. That the serpent was now at war with the woman, speaking of the nation of Israel generally, and specifically Mary, who would give birth to the Messiah, the Savior, the one that God promised. He would come to do the work to free us from our sin, to regain the peace that was ours in the garden when we were connected with God before we had rebelled against Him. And the work of the cross would be difficult. God said in this declaration of war that, that the serpent would bruise his heel. In the Greek, would overwhelm him or crush him. I've talked with people that have had that kind of crushing of their heel, their Achilles in that area, and how painful it is. It speaks to that moment when Jesus came and he died on the cross and he took the hit from the enemy, from the serpent. But in that hostility, it says that Jesus would crush the serpent's head. <laughs> That's a lot different than just being hit on the heel Jesus was going to defeat death, defeat Satan, defeat sin, and free us so that you and I could get back to the peace that Adam and Eve experienced before their rebellion. The Garden of Eden, the paradise, was a, a model for us of what God desired for us. And the reality is, as we look at that story, it's a model for what God desires for your life and my life today. I know in our area, they're building lots of homes. And when people come into the area looking for a new home, they, they'll often stop in the office and then they'll be taken to some model homes. And in those model homes, they walk through and they see a picture and perfect decoration and the couches are beautiful and the floors are clean and everything looks stellar, right? That's what the models look like. God started in Genesis. This is the context of the resurrection story. He started in Genesis showing the peace that he desired for you and me, for all of humankind. And yet our rebellion, when Adam and Eve said thanks but no thanks, peace was lost. And the rest of the story, the historical story of Jesus, tells the story of a God who is so madly in love with you that he had to come and do the work of the cross, defeat the serpent so that he could bring us back into connection with himself so that you and I could experience the peace of God. You see, when that moment happened in the garden, life became hostile. That's what enmity means. It was a declaration of war. And you and I, as we look at our world today, 
We can attest to that, can't we? Our life is filled with wars and battles and struggles and challenges. We might even say filled with chaos. And yet Jesus came in the midst of the chaos to bring us the peace of God. It has nothing to do with what's happening out there, but what's happening in here. God wants you and I to know His peace. That's the context of the resurrection story. That there was one that was promised who would come to do the work to regain the peace so that you and I could know the power of God in our lives for life-changing change in our life to, to become different people. You see, if, you'll, if you never find, you'll never find the solution till you first ask, what's the problem? And the problem for humankind for us is making that move to say, you know, I can find peace somewhere else. I can live life on my own. I can do it on my own terms. And in the midst of that, we search for peace in the midst of the chaos, and we come up empty. You might be asking yourself this morning, is it possible to have that kind of peace in your life? Is it possible in the midst of the storms and the struggles and the challenges that you're facing to have the peace of God in your life? I often think of those pictures that they show us in the eye of the storm of a hurricane. Where outside the eye, the, the storm is raging, the winds are blowing, the rain is falling, and the winds are howling, but in the eye of the storm, it's calm and tranquil. God is offering you and me that kind of peace today. He sent the promised one, Jesus, to come to live a life, to offer that peace. And by receiving it, we receive the power of God for a new life. That's what the resurrection is all about. And you might be asking yourself, is that possible for you today? And I just remind you, on Resurrection Day, greater things have happened, that this is a day of miracles. Let's look at the life of Jesus, shall we? The Passion Week, that last week of His life, those last days of His life. God promised a Savior. He sent Jesus to bring and allow us to regain the peace that we had lost. And Jesus showed up to do that work. He came for one purpose, to die. And when He entered Jerusalem to do the work of salvation, to bring the peace of God back, for you and I to experience the paradise of God right here on earth in the midst of the struggle. It was Passover. The city of Jerusalem was packed with Jewish people. It was that incredible feast of the Passover where the Jews were celebrating their freedom from Egypt. Spoke of the angel of death that passed over the people of God and they were freed to the promised land. They were in Jerusalem by the thousands to celebrate Passover. And Jesus, on that week before he would die and then be raised from the dead, he entered Jerusalem with incredible fanfare. It was a triumphal entry, as you know. Jesus entered the city as the king, the one who would save them. They were yelling, Hosanna! which means save us. They were waving palm branches, which in those ancient days was a symbol of victory. Jesus was going to be the victorious king to save us as he entered into Jerusalem. He was the prince of peace that was promised, the shalom of God. And as he entered into Jerusalem, they entered in under the Roman domination and as the people were celebrating Jesus coming into Jerusalem, his disciples remind them they better be quiet. They don't want to cause a problem with, with Rome or the Jewish leaders, this new king, this King Jesus that would save people from their sins. In Luke chapter 19 and verses 39 through 42, it looked like this. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. And when he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. 
Jesus, as he's entering, picture this, entering into Jerusalem, the people are cheering. Here's the king who has come to save them. And he stops in that moment and begins to weep. In the Greek, we know that he's not weeping silently. He's weeping out loud. He's wailing. He's crying. He's overcome. Because he recognizes that as he's offering peace to the world, that he'll be rejected. And the reason is the people in Jerusalem, the Jewish people in Jerusalem, were, were looking for a different kind of peace than what Jesus was offering. They were, they were looking at Jesus as the one who would over, come and overthrow the Jewish leaders and the, and the Roman Empire and that he would be their new king. And yet Jesus entered into Jerusalem to be the king of people's hearts, to deal with the sin that separated us from God so that we could experience the peace of God again, to have our sin wiped away and experience that that paradise in the Garden of Eden. People were looking for an outward peace, and Jesus was offering an inward peace. You see, you and I, if we want to experience the peace of God, we need to understand that the peace happens in here when we accept Jesus' offer of his life for our life, we are restored back to that inner peace that Adam and Eve enjoyed in the garden when we get back into connection with him. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem well aware of what was about to happen to him, that he was going to enter into that war, that battle with the enemy, that, that hostility where he would be bruised on the heel, but by the work of the cross would crush the enemy's head. And set us free to experience the peace of God once again. And so on Good Friday of this week, we remembered and celebrated the work of the cross. When Jesus said, it is finished, peace was within grasp. The one that God promised, the Savior, the Messiah, Jesus came, did the work of salvation on the cross so that you and I could have peace with God and experience peace here on earth, a paradise in the midst of the storm. That's what Jesus was offering. It's interesting, the Greek, when he says it is finished, it's interesting in the Greek, it's kind of two tenses put together, the present tense and the aorist tense, which makes it the perfect tense, which says that the work of the cross, when Jesus said it was finished, it meant there was a point when Jesus completed the work, a moment in the past that has ongoing present results in the future. That the work of the cross that has freed us from our sin, that is finished, not only saves us in the past, but saves us forever. And Jesus said it was finished in the first century. That was a word that was stamped on bills and deeds that said it was paid in full, it was complete, it's done. Jesus did the work of salvation so you and I again could have the inner peace of God in our mind, in our will, in our emotions, with the struggles that we face by simply taking our place. You've probably been reading lots of incredible stories about what's happening through these challenging times. I read a story, maybe you did, of a 90-year-old Belgian lady. The article went like this. A woman in Belgium has died after she refused being put on a ventilator, telling doctors to save it for younger patients. Susan Hoyler-Ertz, 90 years old, was first taken to her doctor for a loss of appetite and shortness of breath before she was hospitalized for COVID-19. While in isolation, she reportedly told her doctors, I don't want to use artificial respiration. Save it for younger patients. I already had a good life. God left the glories of heaven, took on a human form, suffered the brutal death on a cross, took our place so that we could experience life in Him, that through our faith and trust in Him, we could have the peaceful life that God desires for you and for me. You see, what we need now is not more promises. We live in a world of broken promises. We need someone who can keep their promise. And that's exactly what God has done when he sent Jesus to us to do the work of salvation, to give us the peace of God. 
You see, in our world, when people make promises, they're often broken. It doesn't matter if it's a peace treaty or, a, or an agreement or a vow that we've made or some kind of oath or contract that we've signed. It used to be where people would just shake hands and their word was good enough. But today in our world, we live in a world of broken dreams, broken promises. And Jesus shows up as the Savior, as the promised one of God, does the work of salvation so that you and I can experience the peace of God. Can you imagine today in the midst of what we're facing today, if those that have made a, an oath and a covenant to help those in need are, are doctors and nurses and healthcare workers who are, who are there on the front line who said, we're going to be there in that time, just decide, oh, never mind. What about the police and firemen that in our greatest time of need, when we need help as a first responder, we call and, and we get no response? I want you to know today that Jesus is our spiritual first responder. That in our greatest moment of need, God left heaven, came to earth, did the work of salvation so that you and I could experience the inner peace of God in the midst of all the chaos. That's what Easter is all about. And the resurrection of Easter is the proof of that promise, is the proof of that power. You see, people make promises all the time. But God keeps His promises. And the proof that He kept His promise was the proof of His resurrection, that He did indeed conquer Satan, sin, and death, and set us free so that you and I can experience the peace of God. That's why when Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, a church that was just starting, that was a place that was so immoral, so much chaos, so much abuse, so much evil, Paul wrote a letter to them. And he said this about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians. He said, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. There's still no peace. If Jesus didn't prove and do the work of salvation and prove that it was good by his resurrection, we would still be stuck in our sin, separated from God, no peace available. But because of the resurrection, because God kept his promise, you and I can have peace. And we find that peace in our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know it's good because we know historically he has conquered death. Easter canceled this year? You can't cancel something that's already happened. Jesus has died and risen again and offering new life to you and me this morning. And not just new life, but the power of new life, the power of change in our life. In this spiritual battle, God is offering us something new. You might be saying this morning, that all sounds good. But you don't know me, Pastor. You don't know my struggle. You don't know my challenge. You don't know what runs through my head at night or through my heart and my emotions, the fear and worry and anxiety that I have. You don't know my behavior. You don't know how I live. You don't know what I'm involved in. Jesus does. And he died for you. Not just to save you, but to give you the life changing power of resurrection so that he can make you a whole new creation, a whole new creature. In Paul's second letter to those same people in Corinthians, he wrote this. He said, what this means is that those who become a Christian become new persons. They're not the same anymore for the old life is gone and a new life has begun. What God is offering to you today through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you can trust Him with your life, is the peace of God in the midst of the chaos. And the best way that I can share that with you this morning is to let you know that Jesus has made a difference in many people's lives. I've asked some of our people at LifePoint to just share a testimony of the difference that Jesus makes in their life. And I want to encourage you with that this morning. What has Jesus done in my life? everything. Because of Christ in our lives, we believe that we have a God who loves us and who 
cares about us. And that gives us hope each and every day. God is good all the time. Now, this is our opportunity. This is our day. So just trust and obey Him. And because there is no other better way. Amen? Amen. He's been a friend, a father, protector, provider. Everything I have in my life is because of what Jesus did on the cross for me. Kindness and love. Jesus' heart is pure, and he gives me an example of how I want to be and how I want my heart to be. I was shown Jesus' love and his compassion and his empathy through all the people last year when we went through a tough time. He held me together when last year with my girls, keeping me strong for them, and then I just can't stress enough about how he brought everybody in to help me and her at the same time last year. So without Jesus' heart, life would be a little more difficult. The Bible says to cast your anxiety on God because he cares for you. Before I knew him, I had no outlet for my fears. And now that I know him, I can run to him with anything and he gives me peace. For our family, for our marriage, for our kids. Um, and he loves us. And especially in times of uncertainties like this, um, we can run to him and trust that he's got a plan. My life isn't my own. Um, it was bought with a price, and that was Jesus' love by dying on the cross. So this Easter season, I just want to give him all the praise and glory for everything he's positive that he's done in my life and that he continues to do. I'm happy even when I'm not happy. And that might sound crazy, but when I'm stressed out about school, about work, about this whole situation going on, I could still find happiness and joy in the craziest things. Happy Resurrection Day. Jesus said, I am he who is alive and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. We serve a risen Savior. Amen. The way I feel that Jesus made a difference in my life was by giving me the chance to meet all of my friends. You know, he gave me the opportunity to meet people who could help me learn more about him. And also I could help them learn more about him as well. And that's how I feel that he made a difference in my life. Why should I dwell on all these little things when there's so much more out there for me? And that God has a plan, so there's no need to worry. Through a personal relationship with Jesus, he has made life fulfilling. Uh, life with Jesus is real, it's pure, and it's what I cling to in times of deep sorrow and great joy. Because He brought me out of the pits of hell. By that I mean from my addiction. And I'm able to see my family and be a part of them, be a part of me, and be a productive member of society. My life would be nothing if He didn't die for me. And I owe everything to Him. That's how I know it's real. Jesus can make a difference in your life. Jesus said if you're willing to lose your life, you can gain it. That if you're willing to give up your life and take Jesus' life in return, you can have the peace of God today. I don't know how you've been spending your time sheltering with family, but I know a lot of people like to read. And I came across this post that I think might mean something to you. It said this, the main character in my favorite book dies, but it's okay. He comes back to life after three days. I recommend it to you 100%. You want a new life? You want a different direction? That's what Jesus is offering you today. He is the promised one. He is the one that is offering peace in the midst of the chaos. And through your connection with him, the life-changing power of resurrection. Will you pray with me this morning? Maybe with your head bowed, eyes closed this morning, let's give opportunity to commit ourselves to the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for the work of the cross that has freed us and set us free. And at home this morning, if 
you want a changed life, you want a new life, you're willing to say, God, I want to get rid of my old life and get something completely new. If that's you this morning, I'm going to just invite you to pray this simple prayer in your heart. Prayer is just talking with God, but what God's interested in is the prayer of your heart. And so if this is what you mean in your heart, I invite you just to repeat it after me. You can say it out loud or in your heart, whatever way you like. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for coming for me and doing the work of salvation. Forgive me of my rebellion against you. I invite you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Change me by your resurrection power and give me peace in the middle of the storm. Father, we thank you for your peace, your perfect peace. Get us back to that place of paradise that you promised. Father, we trust you with our very lives. We pray that you would continue that work of changing us into the people that you desire us to be. Thank you for resurrection and this incredible day of celebration. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.